Hi everyone, uh, welcome to lecture 19 of Solitons. Last time I introduced uh, Hirota's reformulation of the KDV equation, and to remind you, it went like this. Uh, we started from a field U that solves uh, the KDV equation, ut plus 6u ux uh, plus u x x x equal to zero. And then uh, uh, inspired by a rewriting of the one soliton solution, we set uh, u to be equal to uh, twice uh, the second uh, partial derivative with respect to x of the logarithm of a new function f, uh, which often in, in the literature it is called the tau function, but I will call it f um, uh, in this course. And then uh, uh, after um, some manipulations, it's possible to show that the KDV equation for u can be written uh, as in this uh, bilinear form uh, in terms of the function f, where uh, capital dt dx and uh, capital dx to the fourth were uh, two instances of uh, uh, so-called uh, bilinear differential operators, which were introduced by Hirota and uh, are defined by this expression here. Just to remind you, uh, Hirota bilinear differential operator acts on a pair of functions uh, f and g and outputs uh, a new function uh, of uh, x and t. And in particular for uh, uh, bilinear differential operators, which are just monomials in uh, uh, T and X uh, derivatives that are defined uh, in this way. So uh, we start from uh, the functions F uh, of X and T and G of X prime T prime. Then we take uh, this uh, time uh, and space derivatives uh, with respect to the two sets of coordinates with uh, crucially this minus signs. And uh, uh, at the end of the calculation, we set x prime equal to x and t prime equal to t. We practice uh, a little bit uh, with this uh, bilinear differential operators uh, last time, and uh, there will be more of that uh, uh, in the problems class tomorrow. But what we will do instead today is to uh, use this uh, bilinear reformulation of the KDV equation to look for uh, solutions uh, which uh, contain uh, multiple solitons. I'll go to full screen now. So we'll start section 6.3, which is about solutions of the bilinear form of the KDB equation. We'll start with the following idea. Remember that if f, uh, the Hirota function, is equal to 1, then u, the KDV field, is equal to 0, which is the vacuum solution of the KDV equation. On the other hand, we saw that if f is equal to 1 plus exponential of 2 mu times x minus x naught uh, minus 4 mu squared t, then uh, the KDP field U was uh, uh, one soliton solution. Now recall that the bilinear form of the KDV equation, which was equation 6.19, is, uh, as we said, the bilinear equation. This suggests that uh, multi-soliton solutions uh, might be obtained as uh, sums uh, of exponential multi-soliton solutions might be sums of exponentials of uh, linear expressions in X and T. linear functions of x and t. Where here, um, 
So we see that that's definitely the case for the one soliton solution. And we view uh, for the vacuum solution one being the exponential of zero, uh, that's a trivial case. So that, that was uh, uh, Hirota's first idea uh, that we'll use uh, in a second. Uh, but let's first uh, check the formalism by looking at uh, an example that we have uh, derived already, namely the one soliton solution. Let's try f equal to one plus exponential of theta. Where theta is a linear function of x and t. So let's say that it's ax plus bt plus c. Then we'll need the following lemma that we'll derive uh, in the problems class tomorrow. The lemma states that if theta i is equal to a i x plus b i t plus c i, and here we take i to be uh, one or two, then uh, the Hirota operator dt to the m dx to the n acts on e to the theta one comma e to the theta two, this pair of uh, functions, which are now uh, exponentials of linear functions of x and t, uh, to produce uh, the following result, b one minus b two to the m, where b i were the coefficients of t uh, in the exponents, times a1 minus a2 to the n, where a i were the coefficients of x in the exponent, times the exponential of the sum theta1 plus theta2. And this is exercise 38 that we will uh, do tomorrow in the problems class. In particular, this implies uh, that dt to the m dx to the n acting on a pair of uh, equal exponentials, so e to the theta, e to the theta, is uh, equal to zero uh, unless uh, both m and n vanish, in which case uh, the differential operator is just the identity. That's because we have uh, the differences of uh, the b's and the differences of the a's in 6.22. And on the other hand, if uh, we calculate the dt to the m dx to the n acting on uh, a pair of function, one of which is exponential of theta and the other one is equal to one, that's equal to minus one to the m plus n dt to the m dx to the n acting on uh, the pair of function one into the theta, where we swap the role of the two functions. Now this is equal, uh, if we use uh, 6.22 to b to the m, a to the n times exponential of theta. We'll use this uh, two results in the following. This results, we can rewrite uh, the bilinear form of the KDB equation. For F equal to one plus exponential of theta as follows. Remember the bilinear form uh, of the KDB equation was uh, dt dx uh, plus dx 
fourth acting on uh, uh, f comma f, which is one plus e to the theta, one plus e to the theta is equal to zero. The next I'm going to use the uh, bilinearity to rewrite this as uh, dt dx plus dx to the fourth acting on uh, uh, four terms uh, that we obtain by expanding one plus e to the theta in uh, both uh, arguments. So we get uh, one comma one plus uh, one comma e to the theta plus e to the theta comma one plus e to the theta comma e to the theta. Good, by bilinearity, the Hirota bilinear differential operator uh, will act on the sum of these four pairs of functions. And now we use uh, result uh, 6.23 uh, to notice that uh, in the first term, the two functions are equal. We have one comma one, and also in the last term, we have the e to the theta, e to the theta. And so when the Hirota operator acts on them, we get zero. That's from the first line of 6.23, where we think of one again as a, a, a special case where theta is equal to zero. And next I'm gonna use the second line of the 6.23. Um, and notice that the dt dx uh, uh, is a quadratic and dx to the fourth is a quartic. And so when I look at um, the second line, I see that uh, the bilinear differential operator acting on one comma e to the theta will give the same result as when it acts on e to the theta comma one because uh, n plus n is equal to two or four uh, for the two terms in the bilinear differential operator. And so we get the plus sign. So we obtain two times dt dx plus dx to the fourth acting on the pair of functions e to the theta comma one. And now we use uh, the last equality in 6.23, uh, which gives us uh, a result for uh, the application of the uh, bilinear differential operator on uh, the pair of function e to the theta comma one. And so we get uh, twice BA from the uh, action of dt dx plus A to the fourth from the action of dx to the fourth. And finally, uh, this multiplies e to the theta, which I'll factor as 2a times b plus a cube e to the theta. That's equation 6.24. So by plugging the ansatz uh, f equal 1 plus uh, e to the theta into the bilinear form of the KDD equation, we obtained an algebraic uh, equation uh, that the right-hand side in 6.24 is equal to zero. Since the exponential e to the theta cannot vanish, there are two options. The first option is that a equals zero, and the second option is that b is minus a cubed. In the first case, when a is equal to zero, then we find that f is independent of x. Therefore, the KDV field, uh, which was given by a second x derivative uh, of uh, log f is equal to zero. So this is just a trivial solution, uh, the KDV vacuum. But things are more interesting in the second case when b is equal to minus a cube, because then f is equal to one plus the exponential of theta, uh, which was uh, ax, plus bt, so minus aqt, plus a constant c. And so we find that the KDV field u is two second partial derivative with respect to x of the logarithm of f, which is one plus e to the ax minus aqt plus c.
which is uh, nothing but uh, the one soliton solution that we obtained previously. Very good. Uh, we checked that by uh, assuming that f was equal to one plus the exponential of a linear function of x and t and plugging it uh, in the bilinear form of the KDV equation, uh, we could relate uh, the coefficients of x and t uh, in the exponent uh, of the exponential function. And we reproduce precisely the one soliton solution 6.8 up to a redefinition of the constant. This takes us to subsection 6.3.2, where I'll give a sketch of one obtains and soliton solutions of the KDV equation. Here we'll need the Hirota's uh, second idea, which is perhaps uh, less uh, intuitive than the previous one. Hirota's idea was uh, to look for a power series solution in uh, an auxiliary parameter epsilon. And we call uh, this power series solution in a, a parameter perturbative expansions. This will be of the following form. So we'll assume that our function f of x and t is given by a sum and from zero to infinity of epsilon to the n fn of x comma t. With the f naught equal to one. And uh, hope that uh, the series terminates at the finite value of n. So that uh, we simply get the polynomial in epsilon, we don't need to worry about uh, uh, the radius of convergent and we get a simpler solution where we can take epsilon to be finite. And eventually, since uh, this parameter epsilon was uh, auxiliary, it didn't appear anywhere in the question, we'll take it to be equal to one. So the idea would be to plug uh, this uh, expression, this power series uh, expansion of f uh, in terms of the auxiliary parameter epsilon into the bilinear form uh, of the KDV equation. So to keep the notation short, uh, let me introduce uh, the following notation for the bilinear form uh, of the KDV equation. I'll call uh, b the uh, bilinear differential operator defined by Hirota. So the equation would be b of f comma f is equal to zero, where b is uh, dt dx plus dx to the fourth. And now we substitute uh, the power series 6.26 in the bilinear form of the KDV equation 6.27. We get that uh, zero is equal to B of F comma F and F is some uh, N1 from zero to infinity, epsilon to the N1 F N1. And then we have f again, I'll write that as some n2 from zero to infinity, epsilon to the n2, f of n2. Where recall that f 
not is equal to one so that uh, when epsilon uh, is set to zero, we recover the vacuum solution. Next, uh, I use uh, bilinearity to take the sums uh, out of the bilinear differential operator. So we'll get sum n1 from zero to infinity, sum n2 from zero to infinity. I'll also take the powers of epsilon out. So I'll have epsilon to the power n1 plus n2. The Hirota bilinear operator acting on uh, the pair of function f of n1, f of n2. To be precise, uh, uh, I can do this uh, uh, provided that uh, the series converges appropriately, but uh, uh, eventually we'll look for situations in which uh, the series truncates uh, to a polynomial, uh, therefore, uh, it certainly converges. What I'll do next is to gather terms uh, with the same degree in epsilon. Gathering terms of uh, the same degree. Let me call the degree n. This would be given to n1 plus n2. In epsilon, uh, I obtain uh, the following expression. So first I have zero was equal to the sum of uh, uh, over n1 and n2, and I'll rewrite the sum as sum from n from zero to infinity, and then I'll have epsilon to the n, and then I'll have a sum of m from zero to small n of b of f n minus m comma f m. Okay, I should probably explain what I've done here. So we had the n1 and n2, uh, which could take all uh, non-negative uh, integer values. So they are points in the following a positive uh, quadrant of a lattice. And what I've done is uh, instead of summing uh, over n1 and n2 separately, uh, I sum over n, which is uh, the sum of n1 plus n2. And for each value of n, I'm summing along these uh, diagonals. So this is uh, n equal one, n equal zero, n equal two, etc. And as a uh, small m runs from zero to n, I go through all the points uh, along uh, each diagonal. Or put differently, I set n to be equal to n one plus n two and m to be equal to n two. Okay, back to the equation here. So notice that the sum uh, over n starts from zero, but when n is equal to zero, then m is also forced to be equal to zero. So we get b of uh, one comma one, uh, but that's equal to zero. By a lemma that uh, I stated uh, previously and that we'll prove tomorrow. And so the sum over n actually uh, can be taken to start from one without loss of generality. Now let's solve this equation or the by order in epsilon. Namely, I'll uh, require that uh, coefficient of epsilon to the n is equal to zero for all n. So I'll get some m from zero to n 
b of f n minus m comma f m must vanish for all n equal to one, two, and so on. Where again, remember that f naught is taken to be equal to one. And now if we write uh, equation 6.30 as follows uh, by isolating terms which involve uh, Fn. So we get uh, B of Fn comma one plus B of one comma Fn. This would be equal to minus the sum over M from uh, one to N minus one of B of uh, f n minus m comma f m which is uh, an expression involving only f1 f2 up to f n minus 1 let me move that to the left a little bit This makes it clear that uh, we can solve uh, equation 6.30 or equivalently 6.31 recursively to determine the coefficients uh, fn in the Taylor expansion of F in powers of epsilon. So we first solve this uh, for N equal to one and we determine uh, F1. Uh, then uh, we plug it in the equation for N equal to two and we find F2 uh, an equation for F2 uh, once we know F1 and so on and so forth. Good, uh, this is helpful in principle, but in practice, what is uh, the left-hand side of 6.31? Well, to understand that we'll need uh, a second lemma. Which uh, I ask you to prove in exercise 39 is uh, rather simple to show, but let me just quote it here for now that dt to the m dx to the n the Hirota operator acting on f comma one which is equal to minus one to the n plus n dt to the m dx to the n acting on one comma f for the same reason uh, uh, as above but now we have a function f rather than e to the theta so still it's very easy to show from uh, the definition of the Hirota differential operator that this is nothing but uh, a partial derivative uh, of f with respect to t m times and x n times, where f here is any function. Of x and t. So we can uh, rewrite uh, the left hand side of 6.31. So the two terms uh, b of fn comma one and b of one comma fn uh, are equal because uh, the bilinear differential operator b involves uh, dt dx and uh, dx to the fourth. So I'll bring this factor of two to the right hand side and we'll simply get the partial derivative with respect to X of partial derivative with respect to T plus third partial derivative with respect to X of Fn is equal to uh, 
one half times the right hand side of 6.31, so minus a half sum m from one to n minus one of b acting on fn minus m comma fm. I'll use this uh, recursion relation repeatedly in the following. So I'll give it a name. Let's call this equation N. In particular, when uh, the subscript or index N is equal to one, this reduces uh, to partial derivative with respect to x of so partial derivative with respect to t plus third partial derivative with respect to x of f1 equal to zero because when n is one the sum on the right hand side is uh, over an empty set and we can integrate this uh, equation once with respect to x and we would get that partial derivative with respect to t plus third partial derivative with respect to x of uh, f1 is equal to a uh, constant uh, with respect to x, uh, which is uh, in general a function of t, but uh, with uh, appropriate boundary conditions, we can uh, uh, impose that the right hand side vanishes. Or if we're not happy with the uh, choice of boundary conditions, uh, remember that uh, anyway, we can just look for some solution. So certainly uh, we can restrict to this case. So we get equation 6.34 which is uh, a linear partial differential equation. And now uh, using linearity, we can write a simple solution to this equation, which is uh, F1 is given by a sum of exponentials of AI X minus a i cube t plus c i where i runs from one to say a number capital n so i'll write this uh, using previous notation as some uh, i from one to n of e to the theta i It's easy to see that each of these exponentials of theta i is also equation 6.34 and by linearity we can take uh, uh, some of uh, such solutions. More generally we could take linear combinations of such solutions but uh, uh, you can uh, rescale the coefficients to be equal to one by uh, shifting uh, the constants ci. And now that we have uh, found a simple solution for f1 then uh, the higher coefficients in this uh, uh, Taylor expansion of F in the auxiliary parameter epsilon are then uh, determined recursively. Using uh, this uh, equation N, which was 6.33. that you see here. And now comes uh, an amazing fact that uh, Hirota understood, namely that with this uh, F1 in equation 6.35, the Taylor expansion 
6.26 of f uh, in uh, powers of epsilon terminates uh, at uh, order capital N, where capital N is the number of summons in 6.35. Indeed, all uh, higher order equations uh, equation N with uh, small n larger than capital N are solved by taking Fn to be equal to zero and small n is larger than capital N. This is uh, uh, quite non-trivial, by the way. So it requires that uh, all the functions F1, F2 up to F uh, capital N satisfy certain consistency conditions, uh, namely that uh, the right-hand side of uh, uh, equation N in 6.33 vanishes for all uh, values of uh, small n from uh, um, capital N plus one to, to capital N. We'll uh, explore uh, this uh, further in the exercises. And so to summarize, uh, the idea is that uh, this takes us to what will turn out to be the n soliton uh, solution of KDV which will take uh, the form where f is equal to 1 plus uh, epsilon f1 plus epsilon squared f2 plus dot 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 up to epsilon to the capital N fn And then the expansion stops there. And furthermore, one can then set uh, epsilon to be equal to one, or alternatively, epsilon can be absorbed in the constant uh, ci. Unfortunately, we don't have time to prove this uh, statement in full generality, but uh, let's look at a few examples instead, which hopefully will convince you that the statement is correct. So let's first start with capital N uh, equal to one. Uh, that should be just the one soliton solution that we have uh, encountered already. So we'll have uh, that F1 is equal uh, to a single exponential. So I'll call uh, A1 A and C1 C. Simplify the notation. So we'll have uh, E to the theta, which is E to the AX minus A cubed T plus C. And then uh, we know that that solves uh, equation one, but let's look at the uh, equation two. So that's a partial derivative with respect to x of so partial derivative with respect to t plus third partial derivative with respect to x of f2. And that should be equal to minus a half, uh, the Hirota bilinear operator acting uh, uh, on uh, f1 so we get e to the theta, e to the theta, okay? But then uh, by lemma two that I stated earlier or equation 6.32, this is uh, simply equal to zero. So that means that we can take uh, F2 to be equal to zero 
and also f3, f4, etc. equal to zero and solve uh, all the higher uh, recursion relation. And then if we set uh, epsilon to one or uh, absorb it uh, uh, by a shift of the constant C, we find that F, the full F is equal to one plus e to the theta or uh, e to the theta one. which is the one soliton solution as we found it in equation 6.25. Good, so we checked that uh, we don't have to add uh, uh, any extra corrections and the expansion of F uh, in uh, powers of epsilon stops uh, at uh, order one. Next, we'll look at uh, capital N equal to two. And so here we'll take F1 to be exponential of theta one plus exponential of theta two. So equation one is uh, solved already. So let's look at equation two. So we get uh, partial derivative with respect to x of partial with respect to t plus third partial with respect to x of f2 is equal to minus a half b of f1 comma f1. So we get e to the theta one plus e to the theta two comma e to the theta one plus e to the theta two. And then by, by linearity, um, we'll write this uh, as a sum of four terms, but then uh, uh, two terms uh, will vanish, those uh, where we have uh, b of e to the theta one, e to the theta one, and b of e to the theta two, e to the theta two. And the other two terms will be equal. And so we'll get minus b acting on the pair of functions, e to the theta one, e to the theta two. And next, if you use the uh, evaluation formula 6.22, along with the b, uh, being equal to dx uh, dt plus dx cubed, we find that this is equal to minus, uh, for dx, we get uh, a1 minus a2. And then for dt, uh, we would get uh, b1 minus b2, but uh, b1 is equal to minus a1 cubed. And similarly for uh, b2, so we get minus a1 cubed plus A2 cubed. And finally, we have uh, the X to the third power. So we get plus A1 minus A2 cubed. And this multiplies exponential of theta one plus theta two. Okay, and finally, uh, let me notice that um, the quantity in square brackets simplify when I expand uh, the cube of A1 minus A2 out. If I put everything together and I factor things out, I'll get three A1, A2, which multiplies A1 minus A2 all squared times exponential of theta one plus theta two. All right, so we have that uh, this differential operator acting on F2 should reproduce what we found in the right-hand side. And therefore, let's try F2 to be equal to a constant A times exponential of theta one plus theta two. And we would then like to determine this constant capital A. To do that, uh, we substitute in now on uh, the left-hand side, we'll get for the derivative with respect to x of uh, e to the theta one plus uh, theta two, we'll get a one plus a two. That will multiply, say, e, a e to the theta one plus theta two. Then for the partial derivative with respect to t, we'll get the b one plus b two, which is minus a one cubed minus a two cube and for the third 
a derivative with respect to x will get plus a1 plus a2 all cubed. And this should be equal to three uh, a1 a2 times a1 minus a2 squared times exponential of theta one plus theta two. So first of all, I'm gonna get rid of this exponential factor since uh, they never vanish. And then I can uh, simplify the left-hand side. Uh, so I'll get three a1 a2 times a1 plus a2 squared times capital A is equal to three a1 a2 times a1 minus a2 squared. And since we are assuming that uh, the parameters a1 and a2 uh, don't vanish, we get that capital A is equal to a1 minus a2 over a1 plus a2 all squared. So if the previous claim that I made that the expansion in powers of epsilon stops uh, at order epsilon squared is correct, uh, then we are done and we expect to find f uh, to be equal to one plus uh, f epsilon uh, f1, which was e to the theta one plus e to the theta two. And then we have uh, epsilon squared capital A, namely a1 minus a2 over a1 plus a2 all squared times exponential of theta one plus theta two. This equation 6.39 is a two solid on uh, solution of uh, KDV. And once again, we can uh, set with no loss of generality epsilon to be equal to one. After all, that was uh, an auxiliary parameter or simply we can absorb it in the integration constant uh, C1 and C2 in the exponents theta one and theta two. So I'll get rid of uh, the dependence on epsilon in 6.39. This is uh, our conclusion for today. And if we take F given by uh, equation 6.39 and we plug it uh, in the expression for U in terms of F, so you will be twice a second uh, partial derivative with respect to X of uh, the logarithm of F, then we do get uh, the two soliton solution of uh, the KDV equation. But uh, in fact, uh, to see that uh, 6.39 is actually the correct solution, we would need to check that uh, there are no uh, higher order terms. And this is um, what I ask you to look at in exercise 40, which hopefully we'll have time uh, uh, to look at uh, tomorrow in the problems class, but otherwise please do it yourself. Namely, you would like to show that um, the Hirota bilinear operator acting on F1 comma F2, as well as it acting on F2 comma F2 uh, vanishes, uh, which uh, will allow us uh, to consistently set uh, F3, and then F4 and all higher order coefficients uh, Fn to be equal to zero. Good, that's all for today. Uh, so please uh, don't forget the problems class uh, tomorrow. In the last lecture, I'll tell you a bit more about uh, the solution for general N, so for N solitons. And finally, we'll look at the asymptotics um, of the two soliton solution uh, of the KDV equation that we just found. And indeed, we will check that uh, does contain uh, two solitons. See you tomorrow.